you were to witness a murder, how much would you remember? I don't know who stabbed him, if anyone. If your friend was abducted by an armed robber, would you be able to give the police a description of the kidnapper? I certainly don't remember his facial features. And what if you were the only witness to a crime where you were also the victim? The kidnapper of the estate agent Stephanie Slater. How accurate would your recollection be then? I could explain noises. As for visual, nothing at all. I'm here to tell you that eyewitnesses can make mistakes. And I am sorry. In our series so far, we've created 10 genuine eyewitnesses by exposing volunteers to realistic staged crimes they didn't expect to see. When they were on a lunch break, they witnessed a fatal stabbing. Just hours later, when interviewed by the police, they discovered that their memories of the crime were not as reliable as they thought. This person was actually actively using a knife. He went down with that person and then shortly after go, I stabbed him, I stabbed him and he ran. Although the witnesses wanted to be as accurate as possible, their memories often let them down. Did you ever see a knife? No. I did not see a knife. All memory is fragmentary, all memory is time compressed, all memory contains forgotten passages and amnesic parts. The big problem in using human memory in these witness settings is that memory often is simultaneously correct and incorrect. Despite having already witnessed one crime, our volunteers' memories were no more reliable the second time around when they found themselves in the midst of an armed robbery. Faced with guns, violence and an abduction, they discovered that the process of eyewitness identification, a mainstay of the criminal justice system, is also fraught with problems. As some of them wrongly identified two innocent men. Was a person shown on the film? Yes. What number? Two. However, in both dramatised crimes, through a combination of careful questioning and cross-referencing of all ten witness statements, the police were able to discover what actually happened and who was responsible. It appears that the guy without the high-vis jacket is doing a punching motion three or four times to the victim whilst he's on the floor. The corroborative evidence that they had gathered solely from the eyewitnesses meant they were confident about pursuing prosecutions in both our staged crimes. I think it's given us a confidence to say we're doing the right thing and we're getting the right result. Collectively, it'd certainly be enough to put in front of the courts and let the courts decide. Well, you've got multiple witnesses to a serious crime. You're going to get to the facts eventually. But where you've got a victim who is also the only witness to the serious crime, that can be really difficult. In 1992, one such case would prove to be a catalyst for changing the way British police forces approached eyewitness testimony. At the time, Stephanie Slater was 25 and worked as an estate agent in Birmingham. I was a normal girl, had a boyfriend, had a large circle of friends and I, I was happy. I was really happy. Early on January 22nd, Stephanie went to her first appointment of the day. It was a cold January morning and you just kind of want to get back to the, to the office and a nice cup of tea or something. So I wasn't really with it. It was my first appointment of the day 
Um, I saw Bob Southall at the name he'd given and he just looked like an average man. And we went into the house, he looked around the downstairs, he mumbled a few things to himself, he had a property guide on him. And I could see that he wasn't that interested in the house, so I said, do you want to see upstairs? So up we went. And he said, what's that up there? And he pointed into the bathroom. Um, and on the wall was a hook, just a hook. And I, I even said, what this? You know, this is just for a flannel or a towel to be hung on. And then there was just silence. All of a sudden, his hands went under his coat. In his right hand was a long knife and his left was like a long chisel or file with a hook on the end of it. And he just came at me with these weapons. After a struggle, Stephanie was overpowered. He went for my neck and I sort of winced back, but he wanted my silk scarf. And he ripped that off, he ripped it in half with his knife and he tied half around my eyes and half around my mouth. My own scarf became my gag and my blindfold. I, um, I didn't see anything after that moment and that was for eight days. Having driven all day, they finally arrived at their destination. Stephanie was told that no one would hear her scream and her kidnapper left her alone. And for the first time I'm on my own and it's freezing cold, I'm shivering, I'm terrified and I'm just sitting there thinking, dear God, where have you brought me? The kidnapper was demanding a ransom from Stephanie's employers and to ensure that she could never identify him. She was chained up, blindfolded and locked inside a homemade wooden box, hidden inside a wheelie bin. Stephanie had given up all hope of ever seeing her family again. But then suddenly, she was set free. Stephanie Slater was released after a ransom of £175,000 was delivered to the kidnapper by her boss. Stephanie described her ordeal as sheer terror. When Stephanie was returned, I will admit to being extremely surprised, um, only because her kidnapper had returned the main and only witness that could find him. The kidnapper of the estate agent Stephanie Slater is one of Britain's most dangerous men, according to the policemen leading the... The police urgently needed to know as much as possible from Stephanie about her kidnapper. But for most of her ordeal, she was cold, frightened, and kept in a terrifying world with no light. Not surprisingly, she was completely traumatised. Hostage negotiator D.I. Ellie Baker coordinated Stephanie's interviews. It must have been so terrifying for her, and I, I felt really very, very sad listening to her tale. I've never sat with anyone and heard such trauma that a person's gone through for such a long period of time. Despite being the victim of a heinous crime, Stephanie was also the only witness. She'd only seen her attacker briefly, before she was kidnapped the previous week. Getting a description now would involve taking her back psychologically to the scene of the crime and reliving her terrible ordeal. The police decided to try what was then an experimental technique called cognitive interviewing. Everything she told us was going to be an important factor. We needed descriptions of where she'd been, time spent in various locations, if she was blindfolded, what she could hear, what she could smell, and cognitive interviewing seemed to fit into that criteria. Forensic psychologist Becky Milne teaches the cognitive approach to police officers throughout the UK. I've got to try and provide an environment to enable people to say, I don't know. The cognitive interview is a technique based on what we as psychologists know how memory works and it's a collection of techniques to basically help enhance the quantity and quality of information from witnesses, victims of crime. One of the most powerful aspects of the cognitive interview 
is contextual reinstatement, where witnesses are encouraged to immerse themselves in the minute details of their experience. First of all, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. Think about all the sounds you remember hearing this morning. Contextual reinstatement has, on occasion, has been referred to as a form of hypnotism. The academics, the specialists tell us that it's not. But it's a, it is a very focused state of mind that you place that witness in to recover the to-be-remembered event. And it's a great mechanism for accessing good, accurate testimony from that person. Stephanie had actually seen very little of her ordeal. So her contextual reinstatement would have to rely on other sensory recollections. I could explain smells and noises and even touching things, but as for visual, 